Good evening, gentlemen. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and uh, start uh, introducing the topics that we have in Chapter 3. Uh, this week we will be looking at Chapter 3, and Chapter 3 is, is going to uh, take a look at the dynamic Earth. Uh, this is going to get us kind of moving out of some of the thought exercises and uh, some of the uh, more kind of philosophy of science topics that we've been looking at the first couple of weeks and more officially uh, looking at um, what can be and maybe even should be considered a hard science topic. Uh, with that being said, um, I, I will point out, uh, as I think many of you have figured out from uh, hearing from me, um, that this is a topic associated, uh, at least some of it, with, with geology. Not all of it, uh, but some of it. And, and I am someone who, who would hold to um, more of a historical science versus observational science mindset with all the different ins and outs that that carries with it. Uh, like always, we've got... <clears throat> excuse me, a preview of the topics. Uh, and that's continued here as well. Don't worry about this slide. Uh, the objectives, although I won't take the time to go over them in great detail, by now you guys should have figured out that the questions that I ask for the group oral quizzes come right from the list of objectives that are associated with each chapter. So your studying should be driven by being able to understand and answer these questions, especially in terms of how I discuss them and how the chapter in the textbook discusses them as well. Now, looking at the Earth as a system, um, one of the things we, we want to point out and we want to think about is that it is an integrated system. And what we mean uh, when we say integrated is that everything is connected. So in science, we can, and scientists do, divide up and, and we're going to specialize in, in, in geology or we're going to specialize in hydrology or we're going to specialize in biology. Um, or we're to specialize in atmospheric science, and we can do that, but, but we can't and we shouldn't, uh, in terms of our observational science, we shouldn't do that all the way out to the idea that they are disconnected. All of the different systems are interconnected and interact with each other, and, and that drives many of our scientific endeavors and, and scientific uh, studies. And, um, but we, understanding, guys, the way our mind works, it does help us to, to create some kind of categorization. And so scientists divide the Earth uh, up into four parts. In the geosphere, uh, and that refers to rock. The atmosphere refers to the air. Uh, the hydrosphere refers to water. And the biosphere refers to all living things. And so you want to be able to understand each one of those individually and understand how they are parts of the whole. Uh, this diagram here shows uh, the Earth as a system. And, and what I would especially do is <clears throat> take a look at first uh, the, the, the expanded box on the left which shows that the hydro hydrosphere is 29 kilometers from the bottom of the deepest ocean uh, all the way up uh, to a particular point in the atmosphere. We, we recognize that there is water on the Earth in the oceans, but we also recognize that there's water in on the Earth uh, at least up to a certain altitude uh, within the atmosphere, and that's why uh, the hydrosphere uh, where water is on the earth uh, contains both of those things. The biosphere is, is where things can live or can uh, exist. And again, we have learned and we understand now that to the deepest parts of the ocean, 
up to um, about nine kilometers into the atmosphere. Uh, the geosphere not only uh, incorporates the surface of the Earth, but down to the core of the Earth. The atmosphere, as you see in this diagram, is about a thousand kilometers thick. Now we'll look at each one of these in turn, first talking about the geosphere. And the geosphere is a solid, rocky part of the Earth, at least uh, it's mostly solid, solid, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. It uh, extends from the center of the core to the surface of the crust. Um, the atmosphere is the mixture of gases that make up the air we breathe. Uh, and, and it's important that you guys recognize that the air we breathe is a mixture of gases. It is not just oxygen. And in fact, oxygen does not even make up the majority of that mixture. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, all those gases are found in the first 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And so it is that area that is represented where those gases are that actually uh, makes up the atmosphere. The hydrosphere, as I stated, makes up all the water on or near the Earth's surface. So this includes, as you saw in the diagram, the waters uh, that exist in, in the oceans, uh, including the water that is um, in the soil and the water that exists as water vapor uh, in the atmosphere uh, and exists uh, you know, as well as liquid water. And, and I'll say this at this point, um, we have a tendency because we think uh, non-scientifically as, as regular people when we say water, we automatically assume liquid. And in a science class, it's very important for you to get in the habit, and not just with water, but with lots of other things, that when I say water, when we talk about water, we don't necessarily assume liquid, okay? I, I may be using the term water as, you know, the, the name of the molecule, the substance, and it can be a liquid, it can be a solid, it can be a gas, and, and that's important in terms of talking about where it's located on the Earth. Uh, much of the water is in the oceans. Three quarters of uh, the Earth's surface, just about, is uh, covered with water. But as we said, it is in the atmosphere, it is on land, and it is in the soil. And all of that comes together to represent what the hydrosphere is. The biosphere uh, is the place on the earth where all life exists. So if there, if there is a place where we do not have the ex existence of life, that would be outside of the biosphere. Certainly today, we know through observation that there are more places on the earth where life exists than we thought in the past. And those places are considered part of the biosphere as well, too. Uh, it's a thin layer at the Earth's surface, and when we say thin, relatively speaking, compared to uh, statistically uh, some of these other uh, layers and, and, and places and areas that we've talked about. Uh, it's at the Earth's surface. It extends from about nine kilometers above the Earth's surface down to the bottom of the ocean. It's made up of parts of the geosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere. So to talk about the biosphere, guys, uh, is to talk about where on the Earth... Uh, living things exist, and we know now that living things exist in the geosphere, and living things exist in the atmosphere, and living things exist in the hydrosphere, so we recognize that there is overlap uh, here for that. Now, the Earth's interior. We're going to spend some time talking about uh, what, what exists um, beneath the surface of the earth. And I would hope that this raises some questions for you guys based on some of the things that we discussed and based on uh, some of the things that we've talked about and some of the things that I've even said in class over the last two weeks of class because we're going to talk about this as if we have observational knowledge. That's the way we discuss uh, the Earth's interior. But what we're discussing is a model. Most scientists consider it 
a pretty sound model. Most of us consider it a pretty accurate explanation or depiction of what is there and how it exists, but it is an explanation of the data and the observations um, that have made through have been made through that data. So, so how how do we how do we arrive uh, scientifically speaking? How do we arrive at an explanation of what is below the surface of the Earth or what is in the Earth's interior? Well, the first thing we talk about is seismic waves. Okay, uh, seismic waves are the same waves that travel through. Uh, the Earth's interior during an earthquake. Uh, you, you may have e even be familiar with the term uh, seismic waves. And we have an idea of how those waves, which are connected to form and are forms of energy, will act differently when they come in contact with different, what I'm going to call, um, medium. Okay. Um, the example here that the notes gives is, is when we tap on a melon. Right? Uh, melons that have different levels of ripeness sound different when you tap on one side. Okay, If it's more ripe, it, it's going to sound uh, more hollow than if it is less ripe. And that has to do with how uh, these waves of energy are traveling through. Uh, the, the other example is when we speak. Okay. When I speak here, or when you hear uh, the sound of my voice coming through the speakers or, or, or the headphones, uh, that, that is energy traveling through the particles in the air that are eventually getting to the working parts of hearing within your ear. If I talk the same exact way that I'm talking now, and we are underwater, it sounds a lot different. My vocal cords will not be moving any differently. If I talk at the same volume, at the same pace, at the same pitch, my vocal cords will be moving the same, but the medium, water, is different than air. It's more dense. And so the waves of energy will travel through the medium of water differently than they will travel through the air and therefore it will hit your ear, the working parts of your ear, differently and you will hear it differently. So, so in order to understand how seismic waves give us a bit of an understanding of what the interior of the earth is, we have to understand the principle that, that these waves or this energy moves through different density of materials differently. And that gives us something uh, to work with. So as it says here, a seismic wave is altered by the nature of the material through which it travels. A wave of energy is going to travel differently through water than it is going to travel through, uh, through air. It's going to travel differently, I should say, through liquid water than it is going to travel through air. Um, and it's going to travel differently through a hunk of ice than it is going to travel through uh, liquid water. And so what seismologists who are scientists who study these seismic waves do is they measure the changes in the speed and direction of the seismic waves as they penetrate the interior of the planet. When it comes in contact with a different kind of substance, it may either slow down or the wave may, may, may speed up or it's going to bounce off at some obtuse or more acute angle of where it hit it. And, and scientists have the tools and the technology and the ability to be able to measure those changes in speed and those changes in angle, which then gives them some data, uh, even in terms of mathematical models, to work toward uh, and Id an identification of what that substance must be or what form that matter must be in. And seismologists have learned that Earth is made up of different layers and they have inferred what substances make up each layer. So again, this is our model based on the data we have. No scientist has dug down through to the center of the earth and visually seen and taken samples of what's there. It is a model based on certain things that we understand about substances um, and, and understanding properties we can infer um, 
from the data that we collect. This diagram shows you uh, the concept of how this works. If the uh, lines, the different lines represent uh, seismic waves, you see a starting point where a seismic wave is produced and as those those green and purple um, lines which represent the seismic wave travel through a, a particular substance they travel with great uniformity when they come in contact with a different substance <coughs> the white lines represent some changes some speeding up or some slowing down or some different angles and, and you can visually see this in the diagram how the the purple and green lines which represent the seismic waves change from one substance to a, to another and their angle changes and and their speed changes and, and and scientists are able to measure that they're able to measure the angles they're able to measure the speeds uh, and where those changes take place and when they do that then they are able to infer certain things about what the substance must be or must be like at least. And so what scientists have done based on, on this type of study is that they have they've divided the earth into three layers um, at least in compositional. We're gonna we're gonna have two different lists here guys uh, and I want you to be able to keep them straight so so make sure you take good notes through this section and you go back and review it. Um, when we divide uh, the earth into three compositional layers we have the crust we have the mantle and we have the core okay the crust and the mantle and the core and they are made up of progressively denser material as you move toward the center of the earth so what we're saying here is that closer to the surface of the earth and the crust the material that makes that layer up is less dense as you move from that toward the center of the earth the material becomes more dense and that density becomes very important as we look at other aspects here. The crust we describe as the thin and solid outermost layer of the earth that is above the mantle. So this is thin and solid. It's the thinnest part and it's it's the most solid so to speak. Um, makes up less than one percent of the planet's mass. So what we spend all of our lives on and what we spend all of our lives looking at the crust is the smallest part of what the planet is less than one percent of the whole mass of the planet um, in these numbers although they may not mean something to you in passing hopefully you can over time get an understanding it's the thinnest but it's it's still um, anywhere from five to seventy kilometers thick so it's it's the thinnest but it's quite thick um, it's thinnest beneath the oceans. It's only five to eight kilometers thick beneath the oceans, um, but beneath the continents, it's twenty to seventy kilometer, kilometers thick. Excuse me. The mantle, which comes next as we are moving from the surface down into the planet, the mantle is the layer of rock between the Earth's crust and the core. And here we have increased in density a bit. So now it's made up of rocks of medium density. And the mantle makes up 64% of the mass of the Earth. So, so, you know, the vast majority of the mass of the Earth is found in the mantle. And that brings us to the core, which is the central part of the Earth. It's below the mantle and it is the densest. It is the most dense, or it's composed of the most dense elements out of all the different layers that we've looked at and we've talked about. That was compositional. So we had those three, right, crust, mantle, core. But what scientists do is we also divide up the earth into layers based on structure. And when we divide the earth up structurally, we uh, divide it into five layers. And, and, and this is different. This is not compositional. This is structural, and this is connected to looking at the physical properties of each layer. Well, the first is the lithosphere. It's solid. It is the outer layer of the Earth. It is the crust and the rigid upper part of the mantle. So in terms of doing a structural five-layer division, we take the mantle and we kind of divide it in half, and the lithosphere is made up of the crust and the top half of the mantle and we, we, we discussed the, the top half of the mantle as being rigid. It's cool 
It's a rigid layer. It's solid. 15 kilometers to 300 kilometer, kilometers thick. And it's divided into huge pieces called the tectonic plates. So when you hear about the tectonic plates, okay, and, and maybe you need to know or be able to identify where the tectonic plates are found in the layers, the tectonic plates are what make up the lithosphere. Next is the asthenosphere, which is the solid pliable layer of the mantle beneath the lithosphere. So this is this is the second half of the of the of the mantle. Now now I want you to listen carefully to this description. Solid but pliable. Okay, so it's solid like those that are above it, but those that were above it were described as rigid. They don't have they don't have any give. They don't have any bend. Okay, you put pressure on them and they snap. That's what rigid means. Pliable is like think of a piece of plastic or a piece of rubber. Um, it's solid, but it's got some give. It's got some bend. That is the asthenosphere, which is the second uh, part of the mantle. Mantle rock that flows slowly, which allows tectonic plates to move on top of it. So, so there's, a, there's a, another aspect here I want you guys to get. When you think... When most people think solid, they don't think about flowing, okay? But in order, in, in order for us to, to wrap our minds around this, we, we have to understand a little bit about um, the particle theory of matter. Uh, we have to understand a little bit about the phases of matter. So here's the deal. If you have, you, you have an absolutely solid piece of matter, okay, uh, say the desktop, okay, where you're sitting right now, you view that as not having movement. The particle theory of matter tells us that the particles uh, within that desktop, whether it's made of wood or stone or whatever, are moving. But as a solid, their movement is vibration. They are vibrating in place. And as you, you increase the energy, they vibrate faster and faster. And eventually, they start vibrating so much that they start to move. And, and that movement is associated with melting. Okay, so, so a hunk of frozen water, ice, has particles that are moving in place. They are vibrating in place. But as you add energy, those particles move more and more. Eventually, those particles start moving around and flowing over and around and sliding around each other. And, and, and that's melting, okay? And, and if you keep on adding energy, the, eventually the particles stop. They, they don't stay in connection with each other anymore. They're moving, but now they're moving all over the place, and, and now they're, it's becoming a gas, okay? Uh, that's, that's your evaporation. Um, and then it, within all this, we, we can talk about sublimation. But So when I say that the asthenosphere is... is solid rock that flows, we're, we're, we're talking about a phase of matter, we're talking about a place where the particles have moved from vibration in place to kind of flowing around each other. Now the way you can picture this in your mind, and again this is a model, this is, this is a description of how all this um, possibly is happening, picture this in your mind is the tectonic plates, you know, the lithosphere, are sitting on top of that layer that is is kind of flowing and and they're floating around on that which possibly uh, in terms of our description gives it the movement that we talk about in terms of the tectonic plates moving and if we go deeper beneath the asthenosphere there's the mesosphere and that's the lowest part of the mantle and then we come into the earth's outer core which is a dense liquid layer and then finally, there is the inner core. So how do we get five? We take the core and we divide it into two. And we call the, the, we call the first the outer core, and that's dense, that very dense, but it's liquid. And at the very center is the inner core, which is dense, uh, but mostly it's made up mostly iron and nickel. But we don't talk about it as being a liquid anymore. We view, we view the, the inner, um, inner core uh, as, as a solid. And as it says here, the temperatures in the inner core are estimated to be between 4,000 
and 5,400 degrees Celsius, but it's still solid. And, and at that point, we should ask, well, how can you have those, those temperatures that high, which obviously are going to melt the materials, okay, the iron and nickel, but it's still a solid. And this is because there's two things that we need to think about in terms of what phase matter is in. And one of those things is energy, and, and we, we commonly talk about that in terms of temperature and melting point and heating the substance. But the other is pressure, okay? And because at the very center of the Earth, that inner core would be under so much pressure because it has everything else around it on the outside pushing in on it, even though the temperatures are high enough to melt the substance, they stay solid because the pressure is not allowing the particles to separate away from each other. Okay, so pressure is very, very important. We, we see this, you know, one of the places we can see this is, is what we think of as the, the boiling point of water. Um, you know, we commonly talk about the boiling point of water being 100 degrees Celsius, which I think you guys probably know is, is at or near 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But if we are able to create a situation where there is a true vacuum and we're able to put water in a true vacuum where there is absolutely no atmospheric pressure at all, that water will quote unquote boil at whatever the ambient temperature is. And we can, we can actually see uh, experiments that are done where the pressure, um, the atmospheric or the barometric pressure is lowered uh, to a point where the water in that and closed system begins to boil without having any energy or any heat added to it. This is because if you reduce the pressure far enough, there's nothing holding the particles in together anymore, and they start to bounce off, they start to move around, and, and become uh, and escape as, as a gas. Um, so not only is energy, as we talk about it in terms of temperature, important to our understanding of what phase the matter is in, uh, but also the pressure of the environment uh, has something to do with this as well. And the inner and outer core make up about one-third of the Earth's mass. This diagram, which if I were you, I would work hard on becoming very familiar with, uh, shows the two different layouts, the compositional um, layers, and the structural. And so on the left you see the crust and mantle and core. On the right you see the lithosphere, the ethanosphere, the mesosphere, the outer core, the inner core. And the diagram is done in such a way so you can see where they overlap. Plate tectonics is something you've already heard a little bit about. Okay, and the tectonic plates as we've talked about are the blocks of lithosphere that consist of the crust and the rigid outermost part of the mantle. They glide across the underlying asthenosphere. We can describe that almost as if, you know, they're floating on that asthenosphere layer. And the continents sit on top of the tectonic plates and they move around with them as the tectonic plates move. The land masses that we are familiar with move with them. And um, the major tectonic plates, obviously, uh, this, sh this should make common sense to us are going to be named um, for the parts of the Earth that are, are on top of them. Just like if you learn anatomy, you very often bones and muscles will have the same name or, or muscles will be named after the bone that they sit on top of or, or bones will be named for the muscles that are on top of them. So we have the Pacific, uh, the North American, South America, Africa, Eurasia, and Antarctic plates. Geological activity that we experience at the surface of the Earth, uh, very often it takes place at the boundaries between these plates, where plates meet, because where plates meet uh, very often is where movement is going to come to a head, so to speak, or be absorbed. Um, and plates can separate, they can, movement cause them to pull away, uh, movement can cause them to, to uh, collide, Movement can cause them to slip past one another, so one goes above or one goes below. Uh, movement uh, of the plates can cause uh, a shearing kind of side-to-side -side 
motion. So all of those are possible. And with these movements, there is a tremendous amount of force and a tremendous amount of energy that's generated. And um, in traditional, traditional meaning uh, the geological paradigm that has existed for uh, a while now, uh, it is those forces that cause mountains to form, earthquakes to shake the crust, volcanoes to erupt along the plate boundaries. Um, obviously, I want us to recognize that uh, that is a model and that is a description, and, and I think there is soundness to that. But there, we could also have models where there are other forces that cause the same kinds of things. There are other forces that cause mountains to form. There are other forces that cause um, land masses to, to change. And so I think it's possible um, to accept multiple causes of forces that can create what we see. Um, so we, we see the movement of tectonic plates continually. Uh, you'll, you'll, you will hear uh, from one geologist and lecturer, he actually makes the point that uh, geological phenomenon is not as active and is not as intense as it once was, in that we have a history of geological phenomena in terms of activity um, and in terms of... Um, in terms of activity and in terms of intensity, actually decreasing over over the the millennia, over you know the years, um, it is possible in our model that we're describing right now. Tectonic plates collide; they slip by one another, they pull apart, and cause rock to break, cause rock to buckle, push up large land masses that eventually become mountains. If you think about the video we're watching today, that, that Victorian era model where the sand was placed in and the screw was turned, pushing it uh, laterally, and in pushing it laterally, not only causing what, or modeling what would be the mountains forming, but also showing how different layers, uh, older layers could get pushed above uh, younger layers. And, and I think, guys, if you think about that, that, that was a really good model that showed lateral force. I want you to understand something, though, in that model. That model, which gives us something to work with, doesn't show anything about time. Okay? That, there's nothing in that model. Anybody who explain, shows that and explains that model in terms of a certain period of time, they're, they're inferring or they're going farther than what the model shows. The model just shows how lateral forces can cause mountains to be created with deeper, older layers being pushed on top of uh, younger, shallower layers. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't say anything about time at all. The other thing that that model doesn't show us, it doesn't show us what is the causative agent causing the force. It could be plates pushing into each other, but it could be something else. Okay, causing tremendous amount of force. So each model, uh, and I like that model, I think it's a good model, but each model has its limitations. And a model can only go as far as it has the ability to explain. And there's certain things that that model doesn't talk about. So I would say to you guys, you know, do we have, uh, a, is, is the explanation that tectonic plates crash into each other and push and buckle earth and cause mountains, a, a good explanation, I think it is. But there are other things that could happen that could generate large amounts of force that could result in the same types of geological formations um, coming into existence. And I think the idea of a large, even an astronomical amount of water moving very quickly at one time gives us an example of another thing that could create the same kind of force and create uh, the same geological uh, structures. So we want to be careful about how we understand and apply all of this. When the plates collide, again, this is lateral force, crusts become thicker, mountain ranges are formed in that model, in that explanation. 
Earthquakes. We understand earthquakes where there's a fault, a break in the Earth's crust. Blocks of crust slide relative to one another, run into each other. They can push, they can vibrate, they can grind. Uh, they, they can, the shearing forces again, and rocks end up under, under tremendous stress because this is a tremendous amount of force and energy. They break along, <coughs> excuse me, the fault, uh, cr creating a series of vibrations, and that is the earthquake, that is the earthquake being set off. And what we don't realize is that earthquakes are occurring all the time. Uh, many are so small that we don't feel them. It is enormous movements of the crust that cause widespread damage. Uh, measure of the energy released by an earthquake is its magnitude. I want you, very often my students get these things mixed up. Magnitude is the measure of the energy. Smallest magnitude that can be felt is 2.0. Largest magnitude ever recorded was 9.5. Magnitudes greater than 7.0 cause widespread damage. When magnitude increases by one whole number, it indicates 30 times more energy than the whole number below it. So, uh, an earthquake of 3.0 has 30 times more energy than 2.0 just to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of energy. Earthquakes tend to occur at or near tectonic plate boundaries, but not all the time. That is where the majority of them are. That's where most of the stresses seem to be, where tectonic plates are separating, colliding, slipping, shearing. Okay. We know about the San Andreas Fault. Okay, That's where North American Plate and Pacific Plate uh, this is a very active area for earthquakes, but it's not by no means it's not the only major fault that we know about. This diagram shows you where earthquakes occur. Uh, the, the red dots being recorded earthquakes, the black lines representing uh, plate boundaries. Uh, and you can see that obviously the vast majority are on the plates, but please note there are red dots in places that aren't near boundaries where earthquakes are recorded. The chat, one of the challenges with earthquakes is that we can't predict when earthquakes will take place. Um, but we, we do have more information now as when they're, where they are likely to occur. Although we can't know that with certainty. Um, you know, I've, I've heard uh, geologists say, you know, certain things like, uh, statistically, you know, where you haven't had a major earthquake is where you're more likely to have the next big one. Uh, so there's all different ways of looking at that. Um, earthquake hazard level is determined by past and present seismic activity. So where we are at in North America, the earthquake hazard level would not be considered very high. Although we, we do, there is a major fault that runs down, down the, the eastern seaboard, just like there's one that runs in the west. Everybody knows of the San Andreas one. Um, but we don't have a high earthquake hazard level because we don't have a lot of activity, at least in the past. And those places that do, uh, they've changed over the years building codes. And science and engineering has come in and uh, to try to uh, increase uh, safety in terms of what could happen. So... Uh, building buildings that are slightly flex flexible, that have the ability to sway with the ground, um, prevent collapsing, all that's in place. Next we can talk about volcanoes. Uh, a volcano is a mountain built from magma, melted rock, rises from the Earth's interior to the surface, can occur on land or in the sea. They're very often located near tectonic plates. Again, uh, these boundaries, this is where a lot of geological activity is taking place. Uh, plates are colliding or separating, uh, creating hot spots, uh, vents that go down to the ho hotter interior of the Earth. Uh, majority of the world's active volcanoes on land are located along tectonic plate boundaries surround the Pacific Ocean. And, and because of that, it's given a very specific name. This represents the Ring of Fire, as you can see here. And again, you will have a errant red dot representing a volcano that is 
on this diagram that's not necessarily near a um, plate boundary, but the majority of them are and create that ring that's known as the ring of fire. Uh, we'll, we'll get to hear more about this in one of the videos that we watch, um, but when a volcano erupts, it can create clouds of hot ash, dust, ga the gases that uh, are emitted in a volcanic eruption are, are, can be the most deadly aspect, uh, at, at least the initial eruption. Gases flow down the slope of the volcano up to 160 kilometers an hour. Uh, they're hot gases, so they sear everything in their path. They're not just poisonous because of what they are, but they're, they're superheated as well. Uh, volcanic ash can mix with water and produce mud flows that run downhill. And as we'll see, and as we'll hear, some of these mud flows end up having a tremendous amount of uh, force behind them. Uh, ash that falls to the ground cause buildings to collapse under its weight, bury crops, damage vehicles, cause breathing difficulties. All of these, and that's all local effects. That's all in the immediate vicinity. We can also talk about global effects. Uh, a major large eruption can change the Earth's climate for several years. Think about this. If you have a large eruption, you have clouds of volcanic ash, sulfur gases, reach up into the upper atmosphere, spread across the planet, reduce the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. This ends up being a global effect uh, that can take several years to, to pass. Reduction of sunlight causes a drop in the average global surface temperature. That's going to have an impact on crops and agriculture and all kinds of things. And this isn't just assuming. These are things we actually know have happened in the past, at least from, from you know, the records that we have. Erosion uh, is an important understanding here when we're talking about the geosphere. Um, the Earth's surface is continually battered by wind and scoured by running water. And so what's happening here, um, wind and water will move rocks. It will change their appearance. So we have to understand the difference between chemical weathering and erosion. Chemical weathering, um, this is the process parts of the earth, material of the earth is loosened, it's dissolved, it's worn away. That's chemical weathering. Erosion has to do with the mechanical action of moving the loose material from point A to point B. So chemical weathering breaks it down, erosion moves it. And erosion can be done by any natural agent that it will mechanically move the loosened material. Wind will erode because it will move it. Water will erode because it will move it. Ice, think about glaciers, they move it. Even gravity, okay, you get loosened material on the top of a bluff, gravity pulls it down to the bottom of the bluff. Um, weathering erosion will wear down rocks, makes them smoother as time passes. Um, and so, again, I want you to see something in terms of models. There is a bit of logic here that older mountains are going to look smoother than younger ones because older mountains have been around longer and have had more time to allow for uh, these processes to wear them down, kind of smooth the edges. But I think it's also perfectly logical to think about something like the effect that a large amount of water, rushing water has, which we see in, in, in small cases, um, also smoothing things out. And so uh, what I'm describing here is just understanding that there can be other logical explanations uh, as well. We have seen um, the coasts be completely reshaped in a matter of days when a major hurricane or storm comes through. Um, so we know that things can be changed in a short amount of time as well. Uh, erosion by rivers, oceans, changes on the Earth's surface. Again, I just talked about a storm. Um, you know, I was in New York when Superstorm Sandy came through, you know, dealt a blow to uh, the coast of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Um, they have satellite images that show the coastline the day before the storm and show the coastline the day after the storm and it's two completely different coastlines uh, in a matter of 48 hours. 
uh, ocean storms erode coastlines, uh, give rise to lots of different landforms. Rivers carve deep gorges into uh, landscape. We know that rivers change their course of flow uh, over time, sometimes very rapidly. Oxbow lakes are formed as river flows to follow a path of least resistance. Eventually, uh, it pinches off and creates this oxbow lake. Um, all these things we, we know happen. Wind changes the landscape of the planet. Where few plants grow, beaches and deserts, wind can blow away soil very quickly. We understand the importance of root systems to hold down the soil and the sand that's there. Soft rocks like sandstone uh, are more susceptible to erosion. Uh, granite is less susceptible.